Hi, uh, welcome to our virtual workshop. My name is Ross Douglas, and I'm the founder of Autonomy Paris and the Urban Mobility Company. So this is the first virtual workshop we're hosting with our partner, MoveIt. Thank you very much to MoveIt and Alon to make this possible. All right, let's, let's get going then um, and wait until Alan comes back. So what we're wanting to discuss today is a, a panel discussion with the impacts of COVID-19 um, on the public transport industry. And starting off to set the scene uh, with Anna and Philip, what are the key tools that you are using to reduce the risk of viral transmission on your respective public transport systems? Is it social distancing, demand management, hygiene, or track and tracing? Okay. Maybe I can start with uh, with this one. So, so we are using a, a mix of uh, of what you mentioned. Maybe the the first point I, ca I, I can say is that uh, in this uh, you know recovery, we are we are helped uh, uh, so by the fact that the, the the ridership, the frequentation of the network is restarting very slowly, which is uh, which is good in terms of uh, protecting the. Uh, passenger and, and our uh, employees. So the, the the first tool obviously is the is the mask. So depending on local uh, regulation, it's a man, it's a man, it's a mandatory it's mandatory or not. It's, this is the case in in France and Germany. Uh, I don't think it is the case in Denmark, for example. But uh, in most countries where we are operating. Uh, this was passed in the in the local uh, regulation. Uh, next tool is uh, hygiene, i.e. Uh, cleaning. And so we we are cleaning more than usual all uh, vehicles uh, used by the by the public, uh, and we we do everything we can to to make it visible because uh, it's a it's a question of hygiene. It's also a question of uh, of trust. I mean, we we want people uh, passenger to see what we what we are doing. Another tool is that uh, on board is the human, what we call human presence on board and uh, in the stations. So we we have uh, our employees that are here to to help people, to guide them, to to recall the, the uh, uh, safe uh, gestures and to even people that usually uh, are doing ticket control are now on board just to, to help people uh, distancing from from each other and uh, to, to uh, separate if, uh, if people are too, uh, uh, too uh, compact, uh, if I may say. Obviously, we are doing a lot of communication pedag pedagogy. I think that uh, that's uh, that's key that people really understand that uh, this is not a game. I mean, the, 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 this is very uh, serious. And uh, maybe I can uh, I can also mention three uh, concrete uh, uh, other, other uh, actions. So one is in uh, Shanghai. There we are. Uh, up Operating a metro a metro line, and uh, this is also interesting because they are they are a bit on uh, ahead of uh, of us in terms of uh, restarting uh, uh, the economy and then the, the people coming back in in uh, in public in public transport. So just to give you the the number, the, now they are ridership is something like uh, sixty percent of what it, it was before the crisis. So it's quite uh, significant. And here, so we are taking the temperatures of passengers, and uh, maybe more interestingly, the, 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 they have to scan their smartphone, and uh, if there is a, uh, if the, the, the data show that they are in contact, so in a in a in a bus or in a in a metro car that they are next to someone who is infected by the virus they will get a, a message saying that uh, so you were uh, next to a person infected by the virus so please make a make a, a check uh, another initiative we, we had in, in Lyon, so we are also uh, operating all public transportation in Lyon, which is the uh, French uh, second uh, biggest uh, city. So here we had discussion with big uh, corporate company to, uh, based on the data, show them what are the, the their, their peak uh, their peak uh, hours and to to ask them to try to smooth as much as they can. So so to to. Uh, 
that they, they can uh, modify their, their work organization to, to, to uh, allow people to come uh, earlier or later in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the office. And the third uh, initiative I like to mention is uh, in Rennes. So Rennes is another uh, big French city in Brittany, west part of, uh, of France. Uh, we have uh, here we are operating uh, automatic metro and we have pushed the, the services to 110% of the normal services, which uh, allows to have a, a lower density in the in the metro, and so to to give more space and, and more distance to between people. So I think that's our uh, toolbox at the moment. Oh, thanks for that, Philip. Anna, transport for Greater Manchester measures you taking? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, much better. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> Perfect. That took a lot of fiddling around with the microphone settings. Um, so I think the biggest thing for us has been um, the government's advice in the UK, uh, which advises against uh, traveling on public transport. Um, therefore, people are relying more on their personal vehicles and moving towards active travel. We've also had brilliant weather, which I think has given us uh, sort of unforeseen figures in terms of an increase in cycling. And that's something that we're keeping in mind in terms of um, when we're looking at our figures in an increase in cycling, because the weather is such an important factor in uh, the choice people make that uh, we must not forget that this isn't just some complete change in behavior. This is, you know, the stick measure that we've had from COVID because we normally um, change and nudge behavior using carrot measures. So they're obviously very uh, positive behavioral nudges. Um, whereas now there's not been any any sort of choice and it's just been, you know, the proper stick. That's it. You can't do it. So you have to find an, another alternative. Um, for those customers that have still uh, needed to use public transport, um, we're, of, of course, doing everything that we can. So uh, there's been an increase in uh, the sanitization procedures um, on all modes and all public spaces. And um, we're really trying to find new ways of working with uh, startups and uh, SMEs and local partners to look at um, what innovation we can trial in our region in order to support um, you know, the better management of these places. So uh, more recently, we have started working on a video analytics project with um, a startup company from the UK called Humanizing Autonomy. Um, and we're basically looking to do um, a behavioral insight study into understanding the impacts of uh, social distancing and also look at how our spaces are being used and the interaction between different customers. We're seeing an increase in dwell time by customers that are waiting at our interchanges and bus stops because um, there's simply not as many services as there were before. So of course, people are waiting around more, which means um, overcrowding of spaces and therefore having to come up with different ways to make sure that there's enough adequate space for people to adhere to the rules. Um, so we have to continuously um, communicate this with our traveling passengers um, and of course anyone looking to travel on our network. So trying to find new ways by working with startups has been something really key out of our COVID response. We of course have a lot of more traditional um, response plans, but this has been key because um, particularly being part of the innovation team, this has been a really good time for my team to be in the spotlight and to start sharing lessons learned from other proof of concepts that we have conducted. Uh, we have worked on several mobility as a service projects, both funded by Innovate UK and uh, Horizon 2020. And the lessons learned from those projects are now really helping us make a informed decision on moving forward and providing our customers with uh, an integrated platform for um, real-time live information. Um, of course, during this uh, time, we're seeing a smooth uh, peak of travel, um, and that could be also because um, the schools are shut. So um, we're trying to, again, relate every single pattern that we're seeing to a lot of um, sort of these other reasons um, so that we're not getting, you know, some perceived outputs from the data. So it's very um, key to us that we make the best use of the data and we relate it to all other factors that are appropriate. Okay, thanks, Anna. All right, on to Elon. Um, Elon, if you can introduce uh, MoveIt. Obviously, MoveIt's got a huge amount of press recently for the very impressive sale to Intel. 
And in addition to that, I'm going to ask you your question so that we can we can go straight into that. Um, Alan, with social distancing becoming a key element in how cities plan and schedule public transportation, how has MoveIt using data to assist these PTAs in providing safer options to commuters? So, hi, good afternoon. Sorry about uh, the challenges before with some uh, network. Uh, so, my name is Alon Shansa. I'm the VP uh, Sales Internationally for MoveIt. Um, maybe just to introduce MoveIt. Uh, so, MoveIt, since uh, two weeks ago, is an Intel company. Uh, we provide mobility as a service solution uh, number one in the world with the MoveIt application. And in the last few years, uh, we developed also the mobility as a service platform, which we provide to municipalities, regions, and public operators. Regarding the MoveIt app, we have now 800 million users across uh, the platforms, Android, iOS, and web. And we have 6 billion uh, anonymous data points uh, that we're collecting. And of course, we GDPR compliance. Uh, and we're offering our services in more than 3,000 cities in 100 countries uh, and uh, working with our uh, community, uh, which we have uh, around 700,000 uh, people in our community. Regarding the question uh, that you mentioned, um, so MoveIt uh, get a lot of data and uh, we immediately saw a significant uh, decrease with the uh, transportation uh, ridership and a lot of changes that happen uh, with the, the public transportation. Uh, the first thing is that we approach a lot of uh, our partners, cities, operators, and offer them to use our transit data manager in order to uh, uh, shape and update uh, the uh, transit uh, information that they have uh, in order to provide uh, better service to their consumer. Um, by doing that, and we gave it for free uh, for a short time, just to help uh, the user to understand the situation in each city. Uh, by doing that, we also uh, allow to uh, communicate in real time uh, with the riders and notify them all the changes uh, which happen sometime on a daily uh, basis in some of the cases. So this uh, communication tool allowed to push notification uh, while they're using uh, our MoveIt application also to uh, get different uh, uh, information and different routes, uh, whatever exists in the uh, city. And again, in each country and each city, we saw different respond and different uh, challenges. Uh, in some cases, like in Italy, when they started to open now uh, the public transportation slowly, uh, and some other uh, countries, we also provide uh, the on-demand. We It's emergency mob uh, mobilization uh, with an on-demand. Uh, so some of the public transportation uh, in the specific areas convert from the regular public transportation to on-demand in order to manage also the loadness, which uh, we're probably going to talk a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Alon. Um, Pedro, European cities, particularly the ones that um, Polis Network works with, have a massive modal share that is public transit. Um, obviously, with the virus, public transit is a place where people are avoiding because of the fear of transmission. What modal shifts are you seeing taking over from public transit? And do you see a big movement towards car use, or are people actively walking and cycling instead? Well, uh, Russ, uh, we believe that, uh, I mean, we've been seeing lots of different things happening in cities, of course, uh, during the, uh, the lockdown, there was little movement. So it's a very, very atypical situation um, that uh, really allows for, for little uh, extrapolation. Now, so, you know, in terms of trends in model shifts, it's hard to say because it's early. Uh, we have to see how things play out in the next six to 12 months to, to really be able to speak about the trend. But um, we can right now, we uh, should keep in mind, you know, key structural changes that uh, influence transport choice. Uh, we could, you know, quote several, but to, to select a few, one of them is that um, uh, public transport has a huge mass of captive clients, v very many of them often lower income workers. and 
you know, they won't be making more money to opt out of public transport. So that's hardly going to change. Uh, we also know that uh, from past experience that during economic crisis, uh, there are less trips overall in all modes. And so uh, we all know, we also know that um, uh, we are, this crisis will reduce the available income from many middle-class families. I mean, just read the news, hundreds of airline pilots are instantly out of work. So, you know, people uh, will hardly afford to go running back to their cars or to purchasing cars. The price of cars can come down or, or if the oil prices are low right now. You know, I don't want to make futurology. I'm just looking at structural trends. Also, uh, regarding teleworking, uh, we should, uh, it has teleworking come to stay. Uh, many people are pointing out from the uh, human resources sector that, you know, that companies have made a 10-year jump, 10-year technological leap, equipping themselves uh, with these sort of software and equipment. And so... This is note, important note for those jobs that allow for teleworking, which which are the higher paying jobs. And uh, so from the point of view of human resources, in many companies, the precedent is set. Uh, it would be hard to see uh, in many companies people not being allowed to telework anymore. Um, the technological capacity, like I said, is installed. And so we don't even need to have 100% teleworking, even partial teleworking. For example, one or two uh, days per week, as a colleague of mine from UITP has mentioned, you know, even that can lead to people not buying their monthly tickets anymore. And so that makes a big difference for public transport. And finally, um, you know, maybe more indirectly, this is uh, opening the door to a uh, more precarious um, employment uh, relations, uh, which means, uh, you know, higher turnover, lower pay, which again will influence transport options. You know, to finish, you know, all this talk about people moving back to their private cars, it's hard to see now and in the medium and long term, the, the numbers just don't add up. But bear in mind, things are not looking good for uh, public transport either, because Public transport operators are coming out of this crisis with deep financial scars, um, you know, from the operations three months before, and for and they're still bleeding money because of the uh, re, um, impositions on lower capacity. Um, many of them will be forced to stop to interrupt investments now, uh, and that will be felt years from now, not tomorrow. And they will probably not be growing in capacity, but will be forced in the coming months to to serve a growing demand. So rather than talking about this as a question of cake or death, is like, is this the, the final vindication of public transport or its final blow? It's rather, it can remain in a state of chronic pain, which is a problem for sustainable urban mobility because you don't want your main horse to limp when you want to push the wagon for a sustainable urban mobility. And so that's, this is the moment for shared mobility operators to show their unique uh, value proposition, to step forward and to really engage with the public transport authorities and operators. Uh, it is definitely a, a key moment for, for data because it's very nice to talk about uh, trust and partnerships, but like Kissinger said, you know, in the 70s, trust but verify. And companies like Movie that are operating, that their core businesses, data and mass platforms can really make uh, a very important contribution for this. So it's good to have you here, Alon. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Pedro. So we, we're gonna go to our first poll. Um, so what we see in our first poll is that the majority of people were using public transport before the crisis, three to five days per week. Um, and now what we're seeing is 90% of the people have not used public transport um, at all. 10% um, one to two days a week and 0% three to five days per week. So obviously not surprising. Um, and the reasons why uh, the majority are working from home. So that's 50%, 22% uh, don't feel safe, 7% um, not currently running in the city, and 20% are using biking or walking instead. So there we see the, the modal shift. Only 2% of this poll are using a private car more. So that's surprisingly low. Um, the next poll qu the question was, do you think car ownership will increase in most cities in the coming years due to the COVID-19 pandemic? 37% of you said yes, 17% said no, and 46% said no, but only if the right policies are put in place. And I think you know that's what we're seeing, for example, in Paris, 
They've increased the bike lanes from 350 kilometers to 650 kilometers, literally overnight. And one of the things we're starting to see is a huge amount of pressure for space in cities because you need more space for social distancing. And obviously, shops and restaurants and bars are wanting to spill over into the street in order to increase the surface area without increasing the rental and the cost. And I think cities are going to start turning towards car parking as a way of freeing up more space um, for people on the streets. Okay, so thank you for filling in the, in the, in the polls. Keep, keep going with those. Alon, question for you. What is, your dot, what is your data showing in cities coming out of lockdown concerning these modal shifts? And can you use this data to help transport planners and operators understand changes in the traffic flows? So, again, of course, uh, we saw uh, a huge and uh, a huge decline uh, drastically uh, uh, at the beginning. Uh, and we monitor it uh, by uh, country now, and it's, uh, we see a huge difference between the countries. Uh, I can tell you that, for instance, in uh, Israel, Australia, uh, we see, we see uh, uh, that things are getting 80% uh, back to normal, like before. Uh, Italy is now starting to shift back, but much slower, of course. Uh, we created a specific uh, report specifically for the COVID uh, in order to help uh, cities and government to understand the new situation, uh, to understand also uh, in uh, granularity of uh, station sometimes, uh, what's happening in the station, the loadness, how to balance it. Uh, and we're working with them uh, very strongly on a daily basis because it's changing very fast now. Uh, and we see a lot of uh, a huge shift to micromobility. I think it could be uh, uh, like bikes, scooters, uh, and we, we think it could be a very interesting opportunities for agencies, like you mentioned in Paris, and we see it elsewhere, uh, especially uh, when we had the lockdown, uh, some of the cities uh, used this uh, time in order to change uh, the roads lanes, move to bikes, scooters, which uh, now we see the impacts also on public transportation, so. Okay. All right, so the, the, the next section we're going into is, is we calling tech and alternative forms of transportation. So it's so interesting to get those inputs on how micromobility is, is suddenly taking off. Um, 2020 was meant to be the year of autonomous vehicles on our streets, but we are see seeing cities building bike lanes and not AV infrastructure. When I started uh, building Autonomy Paris five years ago, I went to many events, and they were often started by somebody saying, in 2020, there will be autonomous vehicles on your street. There's never been a better time for autonomous vehicles because you don't have it. Um, yet in 2020, what we're seeing cities doing is putting more bike lanes, not really um, relying on autonomous vehicles to move people. And on a, a question for you, I mean, Movit was recently acquired by Intel, which acquired Mobileye a couple of years ago to expand the services it offers via, via Mobileye. Can we expect to potentially see the introduction of autonomous vehicles into cities as safer contactless solutions for extra ridership demand? And the most important question is when do you think that would happen? So again, the acquisition, the objective of the acquisition uh, of movement by Intel was to bring uh, mobility as a service to every city and citizen around the world uh, and to accelerate the global adoption of autonomous uh, transportation so uh, there is a huge link between the two uh, companies. Uh, we are working uh, together in the last couple of days uh, with Mobileye um, in order to look in more uh, details uh, around that. Uh, we do uh, foresee that uh, things will move much faster now. So maybe not 2020, but definitely it's not going to take uh, 10 more years. Uh, we estimated that uh, really in the near future, uh, we'll start to see autonomous vehicles uh, in the streets. We already have uh, some pilot uh, schedule, which I cannot uh, share too much, uh, but it's coming. It's coming uh, very fast, uh, but I think also the adoption will be uh, very fast and it's going to be like a hockey stick. Once it will come to the market, we'll see more and more of it um, everywhere. And from a, from a public transport authority, I mean, you've been involved with autonomous vehicles for um, Greater Manchester. Um, what are your thoughts on, on autonomous vehicles? 
And would you, as a city, look to use autonomous vehicles as a way of taking off some of the demand from the public transport? So we've been working on autonomous vehicles um, for the last five years um, and ever since the UK government made the announcements that they'd be on the roads in the UK and our deadline was 2021. Um, <laughs> we really ramped up uh, what we're doing in, in this space and um, we've gathered a, a program of uh, projects from, from both uh, Horizon 2020 uh, funded programs and also Innovate UK. Um, and we started to put together a uh, strategy and policy principles around this. I think what's been really key, particularly now in, in this time of crisis, is not uh, necessarily sort of looking so far ahead, but actually looking in the immediate term and understanding the technologies that have been developed for autonomous vehicles and how we can use these now. So how can we enhance uh, our system as it currently stands in the city with this new technology? And that's exactly what we've been doing by working with companies such as Wave and humanizing autonomy and vivacity. We've used their software to start working on trials and make best use of that software and start getting in new types of data that we haven't had traditionally and seeing how this can help us bridge the gaps in our knowledge. So, uh, for example, we are working on trials on smart junctions and AI. And these smart junction trials are basically a connected network throughout the city centre, particularly around um, the Dean's Gate part of, of, of uh, the city centre. So. Um, we're using this to understand um, how um, more time, more signal time for um, active modes will impact the rest of the network. Um, and the use of AI is, is providing really, really successful in this because it's optimizing signal timings for these active modes, but it's also monitoring flows of all modes across the network. And even a reduction of 10% in the traffic allows for improved efficiency and reduced congest congestion at uh, junctions. So we're trying to use this to our um, sort of best ability. And obviously, we know that um, we're not experts. So that's why we are working with uh, SMEs and the private sector as much as we can. Obviously, the unprecedented increase in uh, cycling has led to us having to refocus our efforts more on the reallocation of spa uh, safe road space for cycling and walking. And this aligns really well because we had already have um, a really large program of funding called the B Network. Um, <laughs> it's, it's symbolized by the B. It's a very Manchester symbol. And um, we are looking to increase our cycling network and within 10 years um, invest up to 1.5 billion in increasing this. Obviously, during the COVID-19 crisis, we've had to um, really start working on this a lot more. And, you know, that 10 year program is now uh, becoming a shorter and shorter program as the government is starting to release more funds to look at this. So um, at the moment, we have reallocated space um, in some of the districts within Greater Manchester, most notably the, the Deansgate region um, that I mentioned previously. And the way we're looking at uh, continuing the reallocation of space is through consultation. So once space is reallocated, a conversation is then opened with citizens. And if the citizens are happy with this, then that will become a permanent change. Okay, thanks, Anna. I'm going to go to the results of our next poll. Do you think the COVID-19 crisis will have a positive or negative impact on the development and implementation of autonomous vehicles? 47% 40 of you responded positive, 21 negative, and 32 said no impact. Um, you know, what's interesting is obviously Waymo just raised another 2.25 billion, um, but unlike previous rounds, they didn't go internally to Google, they went externally for funding. Um, and obviously there's been an acquisition by Amazon. So um, I, think, I think we will see more autonomous vehicle activity. And as Alan said, maybe we are at the start of the hockey stick a year or two late, but still at the start of the hockey stick. Um, Pedro, obviously cycling and, and active mobility is something that Polis Network pushes very strongly. Um, I was, uh, you know, one of the reasons you do that is that you believe that people actively on the streets direct money straight into the economy through the butchers, the bakers, the local shops. And I mean, what kind of numbers can bicycles move um, with the right infrastructure, um, you know, can bicycles become a serious part of the modal share up to sort of 40, 50 percent in cities like Paris or Berlin or Lisbon? Um, any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, 
uh, a lot of urban trips can be made by cycling. Uh, but cycling uh, cannot serve everybody, and cycling is no silver bullet for the problems of sustainable urban mobility. Uh, there is no silver bullet, by the way. The key is to have an, a multimodal urban mobility system and to come out of a decades-old private car monopoly. Um, bikes can easily make trips that are, you know, from one to five kilometers in length with electric bikes, even more, and the hills are no longer an issue. Uh, you know, I can tell you about my experience uh, with Jump in Lisbon, you know, to, I just started biking. Everybody started biking over our seven hills. So all these questions about oh, Lisbon or other cities or insert name of city cannot have bikes because it has hills. You know, nobody talks about that anymore. And rather, the, the question completely changed. And it's not about, by uh, you know, do we want bikes is how do we deal with the bikes that we have and with the e-scooters that are running everywhere how do we make things safe for them so um but you know about this multimodal uh let's say urban mobility uh, bouquet or portfolio you know the problem like i said is that we've had a private car monopoly for decades it's no use to blame drivers as a bad moral choice is not to blame culture the environment creates patterns of behavior and the repeated patterns of behavior are called culture. So our roads and streets are designed in a way that is asking for private cars to come in and roll and park. It's key to make changes. I fully agree with you that uh, as cities turn to car parking to free up space, uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, not only you know to put in the cycleways, just the fact that you eliminate parking is a major uh, difference. Um, and, you know, so these times do, in fact, present a unique opportunity, not only for biking, but for everything else, including uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, I would like to share, you know, this view that, you know, it's usually said that autonomous vehicles will be good for road safety. Well, maybe, probably, we'll see. Uh, but what we know now is that road safety, specifically lower speeds and lower volumes of private motorized vehicles, is good for the quicker deployment of AVs. So I would like to see um, companies uh, promoting AV to, to really come to cities because cities hold the key for quicker deployment of these services by reducing parking, by reducing speeds, by reducing volumes of private cars. Uh, you know, this could be symbiosis here. Um, and not only in city centers, but bear in mind, also in the suburbs. Uh, everybody talks about the last mile. Well, sorry, we should be talking at least as much about the first mile, because the first mile influences the choice for all the next miles. And it's important to consider not only the deployment of autonomous vehicles in city centers, but in the suburbs of major metropolitan areas where, you know, public transport want to pull would be good for public transport to uh, pull out buses from lower density lines and where AV companies could operate and really feed public transport with uh, with more passengers and free buses to increase capacity in uh, penetrating routes so here goes it you know a question that starts with bikes and stop and ends with AVs and buses but definitely the question here is not, you know, to talk about only bikes, but to really look at a multimodal city. And that's really where we have to move to. Okay. Um, quickly, question, Philippe. I mean, are you seeing, KLS, you operate a lot of buses, obviously, in cities around the world. Are you seeing the business model changing away from big buses with high occupancy to smaller vehicles, um, able to do a lot more diverse routes um, and possibly going autonomous? Uh, okay, not sure there is a clear and definitive uh, answer to this uh, question. Maybe first I can say that uh, our, uh, what we are doing is a uh, mass transit. Uh, the, the, there is a, I don't know if I mentioned this uh, number before, but we are, we are moving every year something like 3.5 billion of, uh, of uh, passengers at an average speed of uh, I mean, buses, it's around uh, 16 kilometers per hour. Obviously, it's more for tramway and metro, let's say, uh, an average of 20 or 25. So uh, for this capacity, clearly, we, we, we have to keep this uh, number 
in mind uh, before thinking of uh, changing the capacity of uh, vehicles uh, and and clearly to to uh, to connect with what uh, was said before uh, autonomous vehicles are, are far from the, from at the moment of uh, offering a, a big uh, capacity and plus the fact i i would add that uh, because we are also operating some shuttle that uh, uh, the customer experience at the moment is, is, is quite mixed. So I'm not sure that people that are in this uh, shuttle and see uh, people walking going uh, faster than, than, than they do is uh, at the moment is a, is a great uh, customer exp experience. Uh, that said, coming back to your question more precisely, uh, first, we are doing what uh, what PTA has asked ask, ask us to do. No, no, we are only a, a operator, and we are operating with tools and, and assets that are uh, uh, that are provided by by uh, by P by PTAs. And even if we can see trends that were uh, for most of them pre-existing to the to the crisis that we have now. Um, i.e. developing on-demand uh, transport with sm smaller uh, vehicles, uh, uh, i.e. finding a solution for low density uh, uh, zone or, or uh, even uh, electrical vehicle or, or shared uh, taxis uh, are, are part of this trend to to get the mass transit more uh, customized, uh, if you want. So, so this is part of this is. Our role to 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 match uh, to match uh, capacity with uh, with the size of uh, vehicle. Can the can the COVID be be an, an accelerator of all these trends? Uh, I mean, it's a bit early to 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 answer. Frankly, we don't have uh, at the moment a clear uh, decision by PTA say, saying uh, we want to resize our fleet. Uh, what what can be uh, can be uh, maybe a, a guess is that uh, I mean there is a possibility that the ridership is 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 not coming back to the uh, what it was before and and may platoon to sixty or seventy percent of the compared to the situation before the crisis, which means that at one point we will have to to resize the fleet. But we have also to consider that uh, there is uh, something like uh, uh, inertia. You, you know, you don't change uh, you don't change a fleet uh, easily. I mean, the, the, all these fleets are, are paid. They are they are they have a, a life cycle that is uh, 10, 15, and and more for for uh, uh, some uh, vehicles. So, so, I mean, all this will yeah. We have to. We probably need more inside to really understand what will be the new normal and to and to make a decision in coordination with PTAs. Okay, we've got 10 minutes left um, for our virtual workshop. Alon, a question to you. Obviously, public transit, the majority of traffic is moving for the rush hour in the morning and the rush hour in the afternoon. I looked at some data a while ago and once um, in Paris, for example, 50% of the arrivals happened over one hour people wanting to get to work at the same time. Is there a way using data to try and flatten that peak demand, um, flash, flatten the rush hour, getting people to work from home during rush hour to delay trips, integrating possibly with their calendars, Google calendars or something like that, to inform them when the right time to travel is. Um, is Movit looking at solutions like that to encourage people to travel off peak? So definitely we do. It's uh, again, the COVID, uh so, you know, those kind of situations sometimes uh, uh, push a new solution. And uh, that's what happened with us uh, and uh, IDFM. We're working with the IDF and IDFM uh, providing uh, the mass platform. Um, the one thing is that we develop for them uh, in order to flatten the peak time, as you mentioned. Uh, it's called the flex time. It's a part of the solution. Uh, and the uh, application that we provide there is uh, to notify uh, the people when they should leave the house in order to not to uh, to get into the traffic uh, together with what Pedro just mentioned before 
the multimodal, the combination of micromobility, public transportation, and the data allow us to provide better um, timing for uh, the IDF uh, consumers. Uh, and it can be done even in a regional basis. So we are working with them. Uh, it's going to be an interesting press release uh, in the next coming uh, days in uh, Paris. Uh, we're helping them again once they're releasing now uh, and allowing people uh, to get to the offices. Uh, they want to make sure that also the stations, public transportation will not uh, be overloaded and still to keep some kind of distance uh, between uh, uh, the people. So it's something that we already implemented. It will be public in the next few days. And again, it's because of the combination that MoveIt has uh, and encourage also people to use the micro mobility in a smart way with public transportation. Okay. And uh, obviously, um, public transport authorities spend a huge amount of money on an infrastructure that has um, very specific, um, you know, demand over, over um, peak hour in the morning and peak hour in the afternoon. Are you as a transport authority trying to find ways to encourage commuters to travel off peak? Certainly, and that's something that we've been doing for a very long time. So this isn't a new initiative. We've been trying to nudge behavior in this space for a lot of years. I don't want to say specifically how many, but it's definitely been over 10. Um, and we've tried with various, you know, different uh, apps or, or different vouchers or, you know, even obviously you've got the peak and off peak pricing as well. Um, and all this is to basically reach our 50 50 goal of, uh, of modal split for car and sustainable modes. Um, I think the most um, important take that we've had from, you know, everything that's been going on is actually trying to link a little bit more uh, the different flows of traffic to the social demographics of each area within Greater Manchester. Um, whilst uh, traffic has slowly picked up in the last few weeks, um, the AM peak is still um, around half of its usual levels. And this obviously reflects school clo closures and increase in working from home. However, this is not consistent across uh, areas in Greater Manchester. Some um, are seeing um, a sort of 40% uh, um, of the levels that are, um, that are normally sort of experienced in the areas, whereas uh, some are still functioning around 80%. So that is really a link to the type of employment um, in the areas and the relative ability to work from home. So I think these findings are now being uh, sort of worked with the, the combined authority and starting to work with other sectors on making sure that, you know, all this data is being fed into a larger programs because obviously um, where there's a lot of health centers, um, we're still seeing a similar amount of traffic, if not increased as sometimes. Um, whereas in other areas, there's a decrease in travel and, and those are becoming our quieter routes uh, for rerouting cycling journeys, for example. Okay, thanks, Anna. All right, we've got five minutes left, so I'm going to go across to the questions. Uh, we have one from Martin Schmidt, which I imagine is aimed at Philippe. Uh, you mentioned that you do cleaning and show. Do you share oh, yeah. this via video, or do you clean the vehicles one operation so that people can watch you? Uh, Philippe? Yeah. No, no, we clean the vehicles uh, in operation. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's publicly yeah. visible to, to people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's a question from Diego Diaz. Less ridership equals less revenue. Could this be the end of net contracts? I imagine it's a, a question for Philippe and Anna. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, okay. I, 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 I can start and, uh, and I'll uh, let you uh, uh, complement. Uh, so again, I mean, it's a bit, uh, it's a bit early to to, uh, to draw final uh, conclusion from uh, from this. Uh, uh, what what we can say is first, uh, less ridership is clearly uh, less revenue. Uh, we also have to consider that uh, we may have in, in some. Uh, network we also have less cost because we, are, we have decreased the volume of the of the service but clearly the 
net impact is uh, usually uh, negative and and it's uh, and it's really as uh, pedro said it's uh, yeah it's a uh, it's a strong strong hit uh, so what we are doing at the moment is we are dealing with the existing present situation i we, we try to find uh, you know some some uh, agreement with with the pta to to uh, uh, to to deal with uh, the next uh, six months and saying okay with a, a sharing of the of 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 the cost with the idea that we can restart and and uh, the uh, existing or normal con contract after the the six months or maybe a, a bit longer uh, period. Um, so I don't know if it will be a change in the in the structure of the contract, but we what we may see is that uh, what was mentioned before, i.e. Uh, uh, a decrease of the services or, or uh, a decrease of the volume of the of the of the offer, and then with a with a price adjustment, and maybe we will yeah we will start new contractual terms, but uh, at the moment we are we are dealing with the urgency more than a, a long term uh, vision of what may what may come next. Okay, thanks, Philippe. A uh, final quick question to Alon. Does Movit have on-demand projects already running live? Can you explain the process to implement an operation of on-demand? So we do have uh, on-demand uh, projects running. One of them is uh, in Israel, uh, 50 vehicles uh, with the biggest uh, bus uh, operators. Uh, and I, again, I think the main, uh, the main idea before approaching uh, a solution or implement on demand uh, in an area is to understand the, the situation and the demand to understand uh, how people uh, move and how they consume uh, the public transportation in order to implement uh, the right vehicle in the right place in the right time uh, and usually we break uh, large polygon to different corridors we use corridor analysis that we're doing so with the Israeli government, uh, we're working uh, for the last uh, four months just to design it together with the public transportation and only then implement the right solution in order to make sure that those shuttles will be occupied accordingly. Thank you, Alon. All right, our, our time is nearly up, so we're going to start closing. First of all, thank you to Move It, our partner for these, this virtual workshop. Our next virtual workshop will be on June the 10th in partnership with Mars Alliance, which is a European organization um, that brings the Mars ecosystem together, and will be on user centricity and Mars. Uh, you will receive more information in our newsletters. Um, I'd also like to mention that our annual trade show called Autonomy, which is based in Paris, has gone virtual, and we are doing it 100% digital. So please, um, companies wanting to participate, in a virtual um, mobility trade show, have a look at our offers on the website, Autonomy Digital. Um, so thank you all for participating. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you, Anna. Um, thank you, Philippe and Alon. And thank you to our audience for participating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.